Home games, away games, games on the moon, it don't matter. We gotta win all of them. Lift off. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for Hello, good friends. Welcome to another episode of The Layup Line. I'm your host, Kyle Ratke. We are without Julian Andrews today. He is editing this. So as you're editing this, say, hello, Julian. Appreciate it, my man. Uh, We have two interviews for you today. Uh, Iowa Wolves coach Sam Newman Beck and Timberwolves two-way player Jordan McLaughlin, who is my guy. Uh, We'll get into that later. But um, some news coming out of the the Timberwolves content team. Uh, We are merging with... Wolves cast, and we are creating the Timberwolves podcast network, which is actually under the feed you're probably listening to right now. Um, so for the rest of the season, Wolves cast will also have its own feed like it normally did. Um, and the layup line is going to be underneath the Timberwolves podcast feed. Um, but we're going to start to merge in uh, Wolves cast for the rest of the year just to get listeners used to it. Um, and then, then uh, this off season, we're going to, uh, Probably put some new podcasts in. Um, we'll see. We have, we have some big things coming. We're excited. Uh, some of the artwork is going to change, and, and some of our um, whether you like the intro to this podcast, it's probably going to change as well. If you don't want it to change, let us know. Um, one one YouTube commenter is very he wants us to change very badly, so we're doing this only for him. Um, but hopefully, you guys enjoy these interviews. I thought they went well. Um, otherwise, yeah, we'll be back next week with Julian, and we'll talk more about the NBA um, and around the league. Um, this week I talked about, uh, Kobe Bryant, the, the tragic loss that podcast came out on, on Monday and, uh, Cal Soderquist actually this morning, I'm recording this on a Thursday, by the time you listen to this, is, it'll probably be a Friday. Uh, Cal talked about Kobe's legacy, uh, with interviews from Luke Walton, Gerson Rosas, uh, Carl Anthony Towns and, and other players. So listen to that. It's a good listen. It's sad. Um, but it is informative just to, to know how many lives Kobe Kobe touched on and off the court. So enjoy this podcast. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you next week. I'm joined joined today by Jordan McLaughlin. Jordan, uh, glad to have you here. Um, I'm not sure if you knew this, Jordan, but uh, like you're my guy. I, <laughs> I love watching you play. Uh, in starting in summer league in Las Vegas, um, super impressive. Just a shifty point guard that kind of find the seams and. Um, you know, obviously, you get the two-way contract. You you've spent time with with the Timberwolves as well. But what has the last kind of six to seven months been, um, starting with the, the Timberwolves in summer league and then getting to this point? Yeah. Well, first off, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, recognizing my game and how I play, and you know, I really do appreciate that. But uh, the last six to seven months have been pretty pretty great, and it's been a blessing for me to you know achieve my dream and uh, be on a NBA roster and uh, play in games in the NBA. Uh, but, you know, I take every day um, as a blessing and work hard with the team uh, and the organization here in Minnesota and in Iowa. And, uh, you know, just playing hard every every chance I get, every opportunity, make the most of it, and uh, just keep, keep getting better game by game and practice by practice. So when you were in Las Vegas, um, I think the team was probably there for like 13 or 14 days or something, mm-hmm. yeah. which when, when you explain that to people, are people like, oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of, I mean, a lot of people people think it's great. But oh. uh, for me, I've been to Vegas for the last maybe eight years. I've gone to Vegas at least once or twice a year now uh, with some, between Summer League and then playing in the Pac-12. The Pac-12 tournament is out there. And then, uh, you know, after three or four days in Vegas, they all kind of loop and yeah. everything's the same. You know, same hotel room, past the same slot machines, same restaurants. Everything's the same. So uh, for us to be out there for 14 days, it was great. You know, we made it to the championship. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, win the championship. But it was a great opportunity for not only myself, but uh, all the players and the organization as well. Yeah, and you guys have to, like, go to bed early for practices and stuff because I'm sure every player goes to bed super early. Um, for us, like, we didn't have to. So we're covering games, and then, like, you're going out for dinners, and right. maybe you're staying up later than you should. I had to take, like, four days off after I got back from Las Vegas. Yeah. Like, You've been gone for two weeks. What do you mean? I'm like, I need another week off. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, we actually we sat at the same Mexican restaurant as you in Las Vegas. Uh-huh. Um, we didn't say anything because we didn't really know you. So. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> But so you you played twenty three games for the Iowa Wolves, thirteen games for the Timberwolves, um, kind of up and down just with the, the injuries and and now a trade with, with Jeff Teague heading to Atlanta. But for you to 
kind of go up and down and getting calls maybe at last second that, you, that you're coming up to Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, is that hard? Like, is it is it harder as a basketball player or more like personal life? Because like you have laundry <laughs> and like there's just things people need to get done. Yeah, no, nah, definitely. I mean, it, it's hard both ways, you know, basketball and um, personal life. Um, but it's what you sign up for and it's what you got to get done. So uh, when I'm in Iowa and I get that call up to come up to the Timberwolves, you know, it's just being ready to be prepared and uh, maximize my opportunity. And uh, But as far as the basketball perspective on it, uh, it's great that we run the same things and that we have the same type of defense and offensive schemes, so that makes it a lot easier. Uh, as far as personal life, yeah, it makes it a little bit tougher. Uh, when I'm down in Iowa, I can't uh, grocery shop for too many days because you never know. Uh, you don't want the milk to get bad, uh, yeah. go go bad while you're away with the Minnesota team. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's tough both ways, but, you know, it's what you sign up for, so you got to get it done. Is that, is that pretty common to, to see a team with um, the same schemes in, in the G League as mm-hmm. in, in the NBA? So just there's really no crossover when you get to the league? Yeah, for I mean, for most teams, uh, it, from what I've experienced, it's, it's usually the same. Uh, when I was in last year with Long Island and Brooklyn, uh, we ran the same stuff they did um, this year. Minnesota and Iowa doing the same thing. Uh, can't speak for the two teams that don't have a, a G League team, but um, I'm pretty sure they – assign their players to teams that run similar type of uh, schemes so um but yeah it's, for most part it's usually ran the same uh off for the g league and the nba teams when you get to the nba what's the biggest <clears throat> difference is is, is is it the speed is it the size of players is it maybe how sets are run like is it or a combination of everything yes yeah, i mean it's a combination of everything you know uh the lights are brighter um there's uh, um, the talent level is, is there on both levels, but, you know, you got bigger names in the NBA, obviously. And then, uh, yeah, the size and the speed and, um, you know, the smarts of everybody on the court. Um, everybody knows what they want to do and how they're going to do it, and you just got to try and stop that. Uh, with so many guys on the G League team, with, with you and, and Nas and um, Keelan and, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jalen as well, mm-hmm. guys that are going up and down, is it kind of nice having – everybody together and granted you're not going up and down together because mm. uh just with positions and everything and how many days a, a player can be on that two-way contract but is it nice having guys that are kind of going through the same thing as you yeah it definitely is you know um we're, we're all able to talk to each other in different ways and what we're experiencing and uh how we can make it better and what we can do better uh, individually and collectively and talk about what we're missing out uh, when they get back, uh, whether it's either team and how everything is going, uh, whether it's up or down uh, with each team. But, uh, yeah, you know, like you said, with Jalen, uh, Nas, Keelan, uh, everybody that goes between back and forth between both, uh, it's, it's really great, and we're, I think we're handling it pretty well. How many texts did you get the other night after your dunk on Capone? <laughs> uh, quite a few texts and some um, mentions on Instagram and Twitter and stuff. <laughs> Is it like, so you're a smaller point guard, like mm-hmm. that's not a secret, but, and, and like the way that you've kind of find those seams that like reminds me a little like Steve Nashish where you'll get into the seams mm-hmm. and you'll kind of run out and maybe it doesn't look like anything happen, is happening, but then that opens up um, room for somebody to cut or whatnot. But with your size, what are some of the things that you've had to overcome a, as a player on the court, but also off the court? Because I would imagine that growing up and maybe in high school or, or mm-hmm. going to a college or getting a, a G League contract or an NBA contract, maybe there's, you know, a misconception about your game, but mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you've had to prove people wrong on? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as on the court, you know, my size, uh, people say that's one of my, you know, disadvantages on the court, but, you know, I, I use it as an advantage, you know, my speed, my quickness, and like you said, getting into seams on the court that people may not see, uh, but I can see them because I'm smaller. So being able to do that and use my quickness and um, my athleticism uh, is one thing I do on the court. As far as off the court, uh, I haven't really had many disadvantages off the court. Uh, I would say the biggest advantage is, uh, you know, being a basketball player, you um, not getting noticed or anything, whether <laughs> that's yeah, sky, in my hometown, right? yeah. So you you see guys that are six 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 seven, they're like, oh, do you play basketball? Like, do you do this? Like, you're so tall. How tall are you? But I'm like, I just walk around like a normal human being. So that is nice. I, I was I remember there's a Macy's downtown. It's a few years ago, and Chris Bosch was with the Heat. Mm-hmm. And I remember a fan went up to him and was like oh my gosh, you are, you look just like Chris Bosch. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not him. And right. he kept walking. And I was like, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so last year, um, 
you're with the Brooklyn organization, so is Pablo. And I, I guess I, I haven't asked this before, so I don't know the answer. So maybe it's not going to be as good as I think. But was he a big part of you joining the the Timberwolves summer league team, or? Because uh, I, I do, I remember him after the first game, just mm-hmm. kind of talking about how talented you, you were and how he wanted you as a point guard for that team. Do you know if he advocated to put you on that team? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, my agent uh, was saying that him and um, uh, that he had camp come over here, and then Shabazz was over here as well. Obviously, he didn't play summer league and stuff, but. Um, but yeah, my agent said Pablo had came over here. He was probably going to run the summer league team. And once they had found that out, then, uh, we thought this would be a, a pretty good opportunity for me to come in here and run the team, uh, with a familiar system. So, uh, that definitely helped a lot. And, uh, it wasn't nothing that Pablo pushed towards, not that I'm, not that I'm sure of, but, um, it was just, it was great that that had happened that way. So it worked out well. What's he like to work with? Cause guys like <clears throat> Shabazz have talked about how, how great he is to work with and, Travion Graham said that um, last year in Brooklyn, like when he was down on himself because he was hurt mm-hmm. and he didn't want to go to the gym, and like Pablo brings that energy, and he's yeah. like, ah, like Travion was like, he kind of rolled his eyes, like I have to go to the gym with this guy, like <laughs> yeah. he's you know 15 years older than me. He's going, what's it like working with him? Right, it's it's great working with him. You know, I'm, I try to pick his brain as much as I can. Uh, he's been experienced at this level. Uh, he's been a professional for a long time. Uh, he's very smart, and he, he gives me a lot of tools and tips that I try to implement uh, while I'm playing uh, in the game to uh, use it to my advantage, uh, especially being a smaller guard. He's uh, you know a couple inches taller than me, but he wasn't the biggest guard when he played, so he had to use a lot of uh, tricks and tools, and I try to use that. Uh, another coach, uh, Ryan Saunders, um, since I've been around, I, th- I think this is my sixth year with the team, but um, we, we've gone through a few coaches here, but... Ryan's one of those guys that is just so personable and uh, you can really talk to him about anything, mm-hmm. it seems. For all the coaches you've had in your career, what makes him stand out and what makes him a little different? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely, like you said, uh, he's a young coach, but he's very approachable and uh, he's very understanding. Uh, he's been in this um, the basketball profession for a long time with his dad. And um, so... Um, he, he really he really takes me under his wing, me and Shabazz. Uh, he'll text us or call us uh, a lot, and he kind of, you know, checks to see how we're doing, what we're doing. As a point guard, you're the, you know, you're the coach on the floor, and uh, he needs his point guards to be the coach on the floor. And so he's always communicating with me and Shabazz on things we need to do, what plays we see, uh, our tempo, uh, stuff like that. So he's always connecting with me and Shabazz on um, a lot of levels. And I think uh, as a head coach, that's something you have to do with your point guards, especially in the type of system we run. So he does a great job of doing that, I would say. I, I hate that I even have to ask this question. Obviously, um, the tragedy in the NBA, losing Kobe Bryant and his daughter on Sunday. Um, you grew up in, in California mm-hmm. and obviously right in that timeline when Co- Kobe was at his peak of his powers. For you, for watching him growing up, um, what did what did Kobe mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Kobe meant a lot. You know, uh, everybody knows it. He did so much for the game. His mentality on every the way he approached everything, and um, you know what had happened was very sad uh, for him and his family and all the other families involved. Um, but yeah, I mean, he did a lot for this game. It, it goes without saying. Like you know, all the teams doing the twenty four second shot clock and eight second uh, violation. I mean that just that just speaks for you know the respect for him and uh, the game that everything that he did for the game so it meant a lot for sure. Yeah, it was for sure probably the, the saddest day in NBA history and um, you know you you hope it it will be the saddest day because I can't imagine anything um, being worse than what happened. Um, some rapid fire here when it's we're gonna change the pace. <laughs> okay. um, all right, your favorite food. I, I imagine so. Like when I think of G League and, and like the minor leagues, mm-hmm. I think people have like a misconception that people are just eating like cheeseburgers all the time. <laughs> but as we know, the Timberwolves organization, they're we're on a health plan here. Yeah. So, uh, but your your favorite food? Uh, chicken, rice, and vegetables. Well, that's like that's like <laughs> grilled chicken, rice, and vegetables. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, Robbie, if you're listening to this. Um, you can you can pay us later. Uh, favorite music, maybe favorite artist. Uh, favorite artist, Kendrick Lamar. Okay. Uh, favorite TV show. Power. Okay. Uh, have you watched The Outsider? Has anybody watched The Outsider? No, I have not. Corey, PR, no, nobody's watched. Okay. <laughs> so it's on it's on HBO. Uh huh. It's based on a Stephen King novel. Okay. And it's scary. All uh, right. So I watched it on Sunday at like ten thirty. Uh huh. Um, 
and it got over about midnight, and I didn't get to bed until two. So okay. don't watch it. Oh. Don't start it like late All at right. night. <laughs> I'm gonna um, check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Favorite city to visit as an opposing player. Mm. I mean, I like New York when I was out there last year, so probably probably New York. New York's good. Um, who's the funniest player on the team? That can be in, in G League or at the end. <laughs> funniest player. Uh, G G is pretty funny. Gorgie is pretty funny. Uh, J O compliments Gorgie uh, along those lines, but say it'd probably be between them two. But on the Iowa team, Jalen Johnson takes the cake for sure. Who thinks they're the funniest? So there's a difference. Like we all have that. Yeah, friend. yeah. There's yeah. Everybody. Um, nobody really thinks they're funny. You're you're either funny or you're not. Um, with both teams, I would say so. We we don't have anybody that kind of reaches outside of that. Gorgie's like the sneaky funny. Yeah, he, he for sure is. Try to... And then his 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 accent too makes it a lot more funny. Yeah. <laughs> and he's been wearing. Uh, he, he's funny because, like in the content realm, he always tweets and, and on his Instagram posts he mm-hmm. uh, does the hashtag Power the Pack, uh-huh. which every year we kind of change our like the, the what the yeah. saying is. And Power the Pack was like six years ago, <laughs> so the fact that he's still using it, we just love. He's always like game day hashtag Power the Pack. Um, that's fun. So. The rest of the year, we're about. Um, I think we're a little past the halfway point already. But um, do you have any goals individually, team wise, for the rest of the year on, on where you want to be? And I guess along with that, is it hard to put together goals when you don't exactly know where you're going to be at, at what level? Yeah. No. I mean, you. D- I mean, your goal is to always, um, you know, continue to grow and get better. Uh, so I say that's probably the perspective for myself, the team, um, in every aspect. You know, just take each uh each day day by day and each practice each game getting trying to get better and focus on that day and win the day um so i, f- I feel like that's the the goal for myself uh the timberwolves team and the iowa team cool cool i appreciate it man uh thanks for the time we'll have to do this again yeah for sure thank you we are joined by sam newman beck uh, first year head coach with the Iowa Wolves. Uh, Sam, familiar face. Um, I, I was just talking to you on the way here, but um, we miss you at pickup basketball down down at Lifetime here. Um, but it's your first season in Iowa as the head coach. Is it kind of what you expected? Um, obviously, you were an assistant coach um, in, in the G League prior, but w- what's year one been like? It's been amazing. Um, you know, great learning experience, a lot of fun. Um and a great challenge. Um, you know, it's it's taught me a lot about myself in terms of what I'm good at and more so what I'm not good at and wh- or what I need to improve on. Um, but it's been it's been a lot of fun helping these guys and, and coaching. You know, that's what I've wanted to do for a long time. And it's uh, you know, it's it's been fun. And hopefully we, we can win some more games uh, in the second half of the season. Well, you've been I mean, like you're young. Uh, obviously, but you've also put in your, you know, your your fair share of time, you know, in the league uh, w- with players going up and down in the G League. Because I, I think I heard somebody say this the other day that if a player's playing really well for you, it's generally not a great thing for the team because that player's going to probably get, get called up. But what's it been like with with so many guys going up and down and then trying to get some continuity on the team as well? Yeah, I mean. When you sign up for this job, you know that's what it is. And, you know, I always say that the G League is like unlike any other league that I've ever seen, you know, with the roster fluctuation and the constant changing of, of your roster. Um, but that's what, you know, I wanted to do. And, you know, you try to create a culture that can withstand roster change. Um, and it also allows for other guys to have opportunities but no, we always want to see the guys play well, and we always want to see them improve and and get called up, or you know, or get opportunities um, that you know, and and that proves who they are and the effort that they put in to get better. It seems like the relationship between I think in my six years here, the relationship between the the, the Timberwolves and the G League affiliate or the the D. Uh, then D League, now G League affiliate is probably the best it's ever been. But you guys have been up here, and you're gonna pra- you practice for a few days. Your relationship with Ryan Saunders, you guys go back to to when you were assistant coaches here, and you were the the video coordinator, and with with John Luca and, and Gerson, 
the, the communication there, because I think that was a, a point that everybody stressed this offseason and how that relationship was going to be stronger than it's ever been. What that what, what has that been like for you, um, and, and how has that helped the players? Because the players have come up to the NBA, and they really haven't missed a beat. Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, from the top down, they're really invested in the G League, and that you know speaks um, – you know, immensely to how important it is to the organization. And the connectivity is obviously there. You know, we try to mirror what the vision that Gerson has and the vision that Ryan has and, and Gianluca has here in Minnesota. Um, and that's to the, you know, the little details, such as what our practice facility looks like, um, you know, the bigger details in, in terms of what our system of st- and style of play is. Um, but you know, the efforts to communicate and and to stay in constant communication have been great. You know, I, I talk to Ryan probably once a week, whether it's, you know, with text messages, phone calls, um, and I'm talking to someone on the staff frequently, uh, talking about, you know, new sets they're putting in, um, things they're trying out, things they want me to try out. And, you know, I talk to John Luca multiple times a day every, you know, more than I talk to my wife. So, um <laughs> You know, but it's all it's all been great. It's been, um, you know, it's really encouraging for me um, as a young guy who, you know, is still learning to have these guys in my corner. What, what's it like working with Ryan? Because I think the, the people that work every day uh, inside the facility, I think as far as a head coach goes to get the accessibility and, and he genuinely cares how everybody's doing. He's, he's having conversations with you, but working with him day in and day out and knowing him for as long as you have, uh, what's it like working with him? Yeah, it's been great. Um, you know, first I respect Ryan so much. Um, obviously, you know, when I was the video coordinator here and, you know, him and his dad came on and I got to work with them, you know, Ryan and I, uh, grew to be close and, You know, I never kind of envisioned myself coming back here, but it ended up working out that way. And, um, you know, what it allows us to do is I think there's a great level of trust um, and we can have very candid conversations about um, basketball as well as life. And we keep, you know, we remind each other about the process and not overanalyzing things. And, you know, what's what's really important to us as human beings as well as on the basketball court. Um, but I think I have a great feel of what Ryan wants from me and wants when his guys are with us in Iowa. And, you know, that, that allows, I I hope for, you know, our extreme success. (laughs) Some of the guys in Iowa that that we've seen come up, uh, Nazareed, and he was a guy that kind of took, I think Timberwolves fans over by storm in, in July during summer league. And then it was so funny seeing it because it was like they signed him to a summer league contract and then okay he's really really good then they signed him to the two-way contract and they're like okay well he's really good we're gonna have to sign him to a guaranteed contract to watch him grow and progress in the league and and it seemed right away he had at least the offensive skill set but how has it been coaching him day in and day out because we get to see him every now and then and you see these flashes and it's got to be so hard if you come up and you have a bad game and then you get sent back down um, now that there's any correlation there, but what's it been like working with him and how impressive has he been? Yeah, no, Nas has, um, you know, he's really impressed me. And I saw that right away when he was in training camp with us in Iowa. And I said, you know, I said to myself like, wow, this, this kid is special. Um, and he's had a great attitude about it, you know, and he's a young guy. He's only 20 years old and his attitude has been amazing. He's, was always our probably one of our most unselfish guys and I kind of classify him as a facilitator or a point guard or a quarterback of our offense um, along with our you know starting point guard but his ability to see the floor as a big be able to handle the ball and in dribble handoff situations see cutters it was huge for us as a team and I think that's translated to the NBA when he's been up here and he seems very comfortable Uh, playing on the perimeter which is where we had him a lot and he seems very comfortable you know going into dribble handoff situations uh you know spotting for threes picking and popping picking and rolling um so i'm I'm really happy to see him kind of taking that next step it baffles me throughout the pre-draft process that his name wasn't mentioned more even as a second round picks i think a lot of these times especially big men it takes him a while to adjust and adapt to the nba game and we're seeing it where, where teams will take flyers on big big men at the end of the first round 
and, and things don't work out. And, and I, I know you, we, <clears throat> you talked to the media prior to this, and it's hard to say why I wasn't X player drafted, but was it pretty clear just from day one being around the team that like this is a guy that's like gonna ha- you know have a role in the league. You know, I wasn't around over Nas over the summer. You know, I got I got hired um, very late in the summer, so I wasn't around him at first. And when I was in Minnesota, I I didn't see what I've seen now right away in Minnesota. Now I think these guys saw it. You know, the the coaching staff for the Timberwolves saw it in summer league, but I wasn't with them at summer league. So really, when it when I started to notice it for myself was in Iowa. Um, and I immediately knew right away the vision and his willingness to be unselfish was special. Um, and I think, you know, I I compare him that ability to like a guy like Nikola Jokic from Denver. Um, and I think they have similar traits in that sense. And that's kind of what has stood out for me with Nas. With, with players that end up being successful in, in a G league system, compared to players that don't. There's a talent, but I would imagine work ethic separates itself uh, pretty naturally because I think there's so many players down there that are trying to claw them, you know, claw their way out. This has been their dream their whole life. Uh, is that something that um, is, is pretty apparent right away, the, the work ethic, kind of the it factor, whether you're going to put in that time? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's something that every guy has a different work ethic and how they like to work. And you have to figure out what that is and what what's the best way to help them get better. Um, and and generally, anybody you know in the NBA is going to develop a pretty good work ethic. And these guys, you know, the one thing I will say is when they you know when they're on the court, they they go extremely hard. And I think you've seen that when they've come up to Minnesota. Um, and I think they all have a chip on their shoulder, which is which is big time when you're a, a young guy who's coming into a league full of veterans. Um, and then when you're playing in the G League, you have to play with a chip on your shoulder. So I'll get you out on one last question. Is, is there something in the water at, at Emerson College? Uh, there's like execs from, from there. You're there from there. Uh, not No players. Uh, not, that, not that I'm no aware players, of. No, no players that I'm aware of. But uh, is there something unique there? Is there a how to get in the NBA 101 class? Well, the the common thread between all the Emerson guys was my college basketball coach, Hank Smith. Um, and he was an important man in all of our lives, uh, and he currently works in the NBA for Oklahoma City. Um, but he really taught us how to take adversity and turn it into a reason why we succeed um, and helped us at a young age to kind of learn how to expect accept responsibility for things. Um, and he kind of taught us that, you know, if, if going through practices – was some of the harder stuff in our life than anything else was going to be easy. And, you know, he was really tough on us, but we knew he cared about us. And he created a family there and taught us how to accept responsibility, how to work really hard, um, and how to be okay not getting what you want, be okay, you know, taking a little crap for um, a few years because that's how the real world was going to be. Um, and I think we'd all credit him and, you know, there was a recent podcast, uh, you know, Sam Presti did with him. Um, but that was the common thread for us was we, we, it wasn't just Emerson. We all played on the basketball team. Um, and you know, that, that was something that we all hold really close to our heart. Awesome. That's a really cool story. Uh, well, thanks for joining me. Um, best luck the rest of the season. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll all be watching. Thanks Kyle. Appreciate it.